Sebastian, I'm um, one of the co-founders um, and CEO of 12 Trades. And um, we use psychological data to help game companies like yourselves create what we call player centricity. Um, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, and I'm sure you guys are more than familiar with most of this, so we'll just do a quick rundown. But, you know, this number is staggering. There's around 800,000 mobile games just in the Apple App Store. Somewhere between 500 to 1,000 new ones are released on a daily basis. So the competition out there is extremely fierce between, or, you know, when you're trying to get players to play your game, when you're trying to get through to people um, and actually get their attention for something that you've created. In addition to that, and this speaks, this, you know, speaks to the same argument, engagement is really, really difficult, and it's getting increasingly harder. Just in, just last year, globally, there were 15 billion US dollars that were spent just on user acquisition, and, I mean, the average retention rates are still somewhere between 10 to 15 percent. So round about 85 players are gone after seven days of downloading and playing your game, and you just spend all this money on them, and costs per install are still going up almost 30 percent on a, on a yearly basis. So add to that that just the sheer fact of creating a cool game and creating an engaging game and a hit game is, in, is insanely difficult. You know, how, how do you make that happen? How do you attract players? How do you bring them? How do you create these hit games? Because every once in a while, a game like this will come around too. Toy Blast, right? Came out at a time when sort of the sentiment in the broader industry was collapse games don't work. Well, they don't work until they do, because this was a billion dollar game, and it, I, I'm not sure if it still is, but it's still doing extremely, extremely well. And one, one of the things that set Toy Blast mm -hmm. apart from all of the other games out there was that they had a much deeper understanding mm -hmm. of the players and the audience and of who they were actually building this game for. And this is what we see as one of the main you know, differentiators and competitive advantages as you progress in this industry, as the industry moves forward, um, as to how do you actually find your audience, how do you own that audience, and how do you, how do you cater to them. So a much, much deeper understanding. Um, why is that still so difficult, right? Because, you know, it's, it happens every once in a while. If it was super easy, everybody would be doing it because by and large, it's just the type of information that a lot of the decision-making slash the understanding of players is derived from, right? It's demographic data, how old are people, are they male or female, what educational status do they have, where are they from, how long do they play the game, what do they click on, which, which, which channel did they come from, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with that is that doesn't really tell you, you know, actually who the people are. It just tells you what they, mm -hmm. what they, what they really do. So you're only seeing what's on the surface and, you know, the, the current tools that you can kind of rely on just to kind of illustrate that here, the interfaces from Unity and PlayFab, it's just very matter of fact, basically player behavior data um, as well as some demographic data. That's the type of information that you have. So you can see what players do, what they do, but you have no idea why they're doing it why they're playing a level, why are they dropping out of the game, why did they react to um, a certain ad or a creative or, or what have you. So what's really lacking is, is this, you know, the answer to the question of why and being in a position to you know, give players what they, actually, what they actually need. And that's you know, why we're here. That's our perspective as 12 Trades, as a company, is we're trying to look below the surface and give you guys access to the information and enrich your understanding of who you're actually making games for and who actually is in your game. So we look at things like you know, your player's environment, the emotions that they have, what cultural influences do they have, what type of communication style do they prefer, what are they intrinsically motivated by, What's their personality? What values do they have? What do they actually care about in their life? And you can deduce mm -hmm. a lot from that, you know, in terms of why are they in their game, in your game? Why are they playing your game? Um, and in turn, you can leverage that to, um, you know, tremendously, you know, create drive drive your metrics and create create value. Most predominantly LTV. This is really what this is what this is all about. If you can start shaping your game that it speaks to the fundamental human being behind your player, you're going to have players in your game that are going to monetize better, engage better over much much longer periods um, periods of time. So that's what we're trying to do. We're leveraging psychological data to you know help you guys create better player experiences um, and become that player experience platform to help you guys achieve that. Maybe to take one step back, why all of this matters is this is what happens when you don't match, when your game doesn't match the feeling or the need that your players actually have. You know, it results in apathy, it results in sort of a negative emotion, so the need and your game actually cancel each other out. 
That's what happens when people drop out after you know, D3, D7, whatever it is, when they don't monetize well. What, you'd, what you want to do is you want your game to match the feeling and the need that the players have. Because not only are they going to align, they're actually going to amplify each other, which means they're going to have positive emotions, positive feelings when they play and when they engage with your game. And what that leads to is the deeper you go in terms of creating emotional resonance from a visceral level to a behavioral to an emotional level, that's how you're really going to drive engagement. It's this whole idea of you know people having played Ultima Online for 20 years, or World of Warcraft for 15 years, or EVE Online for I don't know how many years. Right? These games are still around. There's 150,000 people that still play EVE Online, and they're absolute diehards, and they have been for the past 15 years. It's because there's a much, much deeper connection between the, that audience and, um, and what's, happening, what's happening in that game. So. All of this and getting to this data, and you know, I'm sure how you guys go about a lot of the stuff, sending out surveys, bringing in players, player testing, there's a ton of stuff that you could do. And at the end of the day, it's a really messy process trying to understand who you're actually interacting with and levering, leveraging that to, uh, to tailor your game. We're going to try and help that um, make that as easy for you guys as possible. So that's where, you know, once we start engaging with you guys, essentially what you get access to is your dashboard that we provide you guys with, with audience segments of people that are in your game. And these segments are based on what they psychologically have in common, which means those are the psychological profiles, personas, so to speak, this, the clusters that are unique to your particular game. Right? So they're not predefined, they're not standardized. This is a real, real deep look at who's actually playing, who's, a, who's playing my game. And from our dashboard, you get a bunch of different actions and recommendations that you can trigger directly from the platform to basically take all of that psychological data and all those insights and turn them into actions immediately. Things around marketing, user acquisition, um, you know, we, you can, you can one-click generate your Facebook audiences, pull them from the psychological data and translate into what, how do we target people. Um, there's a lot of keywords for Google that serve as trigger words in your creatives. There's general language, um, visual copy recommendations, as well as what game mechanics, what types of incentives, what types of rewards, instant versus delayed gratification. It's really a 360-degree view at who your audience is and how you leverage that to build games that are going to deeply resonate um, with, who, with who you're interacting with and who you want in your game. So how does that all work? How do we get the data in the first place? How do we create that understanding? I'm just going to run through that very quickly. Um, and I'm sure we have some, some time set aside in the Q&A where we can dive deeper into this. But um, essentially, what we've been doing over the past seven years is create our proprietary psychological assessment. Looks like a survey. It's not a survey. Looks like it, but it's really, it's really not. So from the type of questions that we asked, you had absolutely no idea what we're measuring with those, with those questions. That survey is shown to players in the game, somewhere along the game loop where you guys know it's most advantageous to engage players to get their feedback. The framing is typically around help us build a better experience for you. Um, players answer the survey. We get, all of the, we get all of the data. Based on that, we can run all of the computations. We can form the clusters, et cetera, et cetera. And typically, to that data, what we attach is um, the player ID that either you guys use to track your players anyway, or we can assign a universal one that you then, in turn, can leverage across all of your different games, really good for cross-promotion, for example. And then based on just how people play the game going forward, once we have that scientific baseline of how your game works and who your audience is, we can literally scale the psychological understanding across your entire, entire population. So just by ingesting you know, events, you know, the data from whatever, whether it's Unity or Unreal, whatever your game runs on, um, certain events then tell us how resilient are players, how gritty are players, how uh, avoidant of uncertainties are they, how open to new experiences are they, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of work that we have already done with different companies. The majority of them, I'd say around 75 to 80% are in the mobile space in free to play. Um, the remaining, um, remaining clients and games that we've worked on are PC, browser, and a couple of console games. Um, but just to give you an example of you know, some uptake that we've seen based on the work that our clients have done with us and how they've you know, put these information and these insights into action, 
Um, so for example, just on a user acquisition campaign and, um, and in-app communication, it was optimized for thinkers, which is a very one of the four main communication styles that we measure. So just by using language that is aligned with the people that are supposed to be in your game, the average revenue per paying user of those players that were brought in based, from the, based on those campaigns was 39% higher than any of the previous campaigns that they have done. Channel, everything else, budget was exactly the same. They literally just changed the copy and tailored it to, to that style. Another really interesting case that we did was we optimized um, level of difficulty in, uh, in a game based on levels of resilience and grit of players and literally just looked at where's high scores and where's low scores, and that was actually pretty, you know, done pretty manually uh, by the game developers and then adjusting levels of difficulty. Within a week, the monthly revenue in that game went up by 51%, and it's sustained that ever since. Just by, you know, providing an experience that is more, in, you know, more engaging and more closely aligned with what people are actually looking for when they're, when they're coming to your game. Um, this is another example, and just to, and it also kind of colors, and you can see in the screenshot the two tabs between user engagement and user acquisition. So as you go through the platform, there's very clear instructions and you know direct guidance as to how do you leverage all of these different psychological traits and the scores, um, you know, to bring in new players and to engage your players. This was another case that was around user acquisition and using the proper keywords and changing the language where. Um, actually, the campaign had 92% higher click-through rates, more clicks, and actually 62% higher ARPA poo too. Um, another example that's not on the slide that I could speak to um, as well, which is probably very interesting, a very common conversation that we see between pretty much all of our clients is feature prioritization, roadmap, what do we build, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And sometimes where these conversations get stuck is just having different ideas, not having the scientific baseline on which to make these decisions, um, ego might be at play, whatever, it's creative geniuses, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've seen our, our clients do is basically use all of these information that they now have access to um, to make much, much better assumptions, prioritize their feature roadmap for their entire year because it establishes a common language between not only the data science or the analytics team, between the designers, the developers, between marketing and UA, because all of a sudden everyone's speaking the same language across these different functions, and it's who are we actually making this game for? Right? So it's a completely different conversation rather than I have a really good idea and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's going to work. So you know, time to market becomes much, much faster. Launching games becomes much, much, uh, much, much quicker and more effective because you're going to hit the nail on the head um, with the features that you have in your game with your audience um, much more effectively than before. Um, to give you an idea, you, know, you could really leverage these insights, and you probably should, from day one. So there's a case where, and I can sp I'll speak to that at the very end, but where you could even use it for what kind of game should we be building. Let's assume you have a game in soft launch right now. Y starting to use psychological insights into your audience in a soft launch stage is actually the perfect timing to start doing this because even if you only have 500 players or 800 players in there, and even if we just get a small sample of profiles and an understanding of who's playing your game and who's engaged, that allows us to help you guys build a super robust baseline and an understanding of who should be in our game and who's actually here because you know marketing work, but they're not really engaging. So instead of trying to make a game for four or five different clusters and you kind of end up with this averaged out, it's kind of okay, but it doesn't really work really well for anybody. It really helps you dial in your audience early on before you do global launch, before you scale UA, before you scale you know, the full feature development, knowing that this is the audience that we absolutely should be going after because we know that it's going to work. Another really important um, component to using these insights in soft launch is the cultural component, uh, which is one of the dimensions that we also assess. Um, so for, let's say you're launching your game, you're soft launching your game in a smaller market, Luxembourg, New Zealand, et cetera, and you're getting all this data back on what you think is, you know, works with the players and what doesn't work with the players. There's a lot of cultural influences, um, let's say, for example, with Kiwis, that don't hold true if you then launch your game globally in Germany or in the United States. So you've, you've built in this bias around the data that you're getting in soft launch, assuming that that's what our players want, and simply by going into a, let's say, different culturally influenced um, domain of players, 
all of a sudden these things don't work, don't work anymore, and you've spent all this time doing it. Um, you know, obviously, as you go through the phases, global launch, we work with a lot of games that are sort of in a maintain and contribute mode that are four years old, five years old, um, somewhere between 100,000 to 250, 300,000, up to a million, two million DAU. Uh, that works well. And for example, another really cool case, and that ties back to idea conception, is portfolio strategy. So let's say you, you, know, you have a portfolio of five different games. We're plugged into all of the different ones. What we can then give you is a high-level overview of who's holistically the audience that you have in your games that you have access to. And you can start seeing pretty much white spots of needs or motivators that your current games aren't addressing, but that are a core component of the psychological makeup of your audience that you already have access to. And that's where you start informing idea conception, for example. You can say, hey, why don't we build a game that we already have access to 10 million players in our games. It's much cheaper going to them first rather than doing UA and trying to bring in even you know, more new people and build a game targeted to that audience that doesn't compromise our, um, our existing portfolio of games, but is a nice add-on and it's gonna resonate with our audience. So that's where you kind of get this full loop from very early on to what's going on holistically and what audience do we do we own? And at the end of the day, that's really the shift that we're seeing. What what um, is going on in the gaming industry? It's people are trying to move away, and I think it's good that they're trying to move away from that, from sort of this boom and bust mentality, kind of like Hollywood works. If we have one hit game, everything's going to be a okay. It's really about how can you dial in the audience that you have access to? How can you own them? How can you serve them better than anybody else and create games that you know? don't just last for 30 days or seven days, or they're not just good for six months, but they're good for two years, three years, five years, 10 years, instead of consistently or constantly having to, to reinvent the wheel. Um, so you know, feel free to reach out. would love to talk. We can you know, dive deep into all of the different topics, too. Um, I try to make up a little bit of time, so I think, we're, I think we're good on time. I have some time for questions, too. I'll stick around a little bit, too. But um, thanks for sticking it out on a, uh, a Wednesday late afternoon after lots of talks. So thanks for being here, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Bastian, for inspiration.